first speaker on the lectureship this year, Brother Guy and I mean, <laughs> Brother Danny Douglas, he does a great imitation of Brother Guy in Woods, except I'm not sure he's imitating him. It sounds a whole lot like him even when he's speaking normally, but uh, <laughs> he has the topic, the just shall live by faith from Habakkuk 2 and verse 4. He and his wife, uh, La Army is uh, there with us along with two children that they have and we're glad that they were able to come as well. He is a graduate of uh, Freed Hardeman College and has uh, worked in several locations. He is doing preaching now but not uh, local work. He's going out and speaking at other places or different places. He is the editor of Standing Fast along with being a educator. Uh, he has been a public school teacher and principal. He always does an excellent job and we're looking forward to hearing him this this evening dealing with this great subject on the just shall live by faith. Thank you, Brother Michael. It's always a privilege and an honor to be at Bellevue. I appreciate the elders here and Brother Michael Hatcher and all the members of this congregation and for your faithfulness and steadfastness in the faith. Uh, this is the first time I've ever been the first speaker in a lectureship. Somebody said something a while ago about saving the best to last. Well, if that be the case, then I'm thankful to be first anyway. <laughs> but it's a privilege to be here, as always, and an honor. I'm thankful to the Lord for this opportunity, and it's an honor to be among God's faithful people with all these faithful brethren who have come to speak. It's an honor just to be among so many godly preachers of the gospel. And those who are going out preaching God's Word in mission places and local work or whatever way that you may be doing it. But tonight we're studying the book of Habakkuk. And the topic is, The Just Shall Live by Faith. The book of Habakkuk is indeed a deep and thought-provoking book consisting of only three chapters. There's a song that we sing in the hymn book, The Kingdom is Spreading. There's a statement in the book of Habakkuk in chapter 2 and verse number 14, For the earth shall be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. And that's a beautiful statement. And that sentiment is expressed in that song, The Kingdom is Spreading. However, that statement was made in somewhat of a negative context in that it was dealing with how God was going to punish the wicked heathen nation of Babylon. And so not only were there positive things surrounding this, but also negative. And that brings us to an important point being this, that God is glorified when sin is dealt with and evil is punished, as well as when the good is promoted. Indeed, it is God's will that the earth be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the, earth, the Lord. Jesus said, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. In Mark 16, verse 15 and 16. In the book of Habakkuk, we see God's punishment of Babylon. And this is one of the things that was perplexing to the prophet Habakkuk. He could not understand how that God would use a more wicked nation than they to punish his people, Judah. And he raises this question. And sometimes people may get the idea that preachers and elders and others who have been in the faith for a long time never have any questions or doubts or never perplexed or in despair about anything. But we see in the book of Habakkuk that this was not the case. Habakkuk did have some very deep questions. And his questions were not skeptical in nature. 
but sincere questions. And I know that all of us as preachers have dealt with these things in our hearts and our minds. But yet, Habakkuk never let go of God. And I appreciate Brother Bradley leading that song a while ago. Living by faith. Trusting and abiding in His great love. And that's what it is to walk by faith. And Paul said we walk by faith, not by sight. Second Corinthians 5, verse 7. And of course, to walk by faith and not by sight is to walk trusting in God according to His Word and not according to the flesh. And this is another thing that we're going to see in the book of Habakkuk. We see the godly contrasted with the ungodly in chapter 2. In verses 4 and 5, the prophet says, Behold, his soul which is lifted up is not upright in him, but the just shall live by his faith. Yea, also because he transgresseth by wine, he is a proud man. Neither keepeth at home who enlargeth his desire as hell, and is as death, and cannot be satisfied, but gathereth unto him all nations, and heapeth unto him all people. Of course, the man of Babylon is symbolized here in this text. He is a man that is puffed up, enlarged in himself. He is swollen up. He is not humble. And thus we see the difference between a man of faith and a man of pride. One trusts in himself, and the other trusts and Almighty God. In Proverbs 3 and verse 5, Trust the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not unto thine own understanding. But the prophet's name is an interesting one. The name Habakkuk means embrace. From the verb habak, and probably means one who embraces. One who took his nation to his heart comforted it and held it up as one embraces and presses to his bosom a poor weeping child calming and consoling it with good hope, if God so will, as one commentator said. And indeed, only the godly and the righteous are willing to be comforted by such men as Habakkuk. There are some people who will not be comforted because of their attitude of heart but are rushing on to their own punishment and their doom. Habakkuk's prophecy followed that of Nahum who dealt with Assyria. The Assyrians overthrew the northern tribes around 722 B.C. Many years later we see that Nineveh, the capital of Assyria, was destroyed. And Nahum, of course, is dealing with the wicked nation of Assyria. Well, shortly after the destruction of Nineveh, we find Habakkuk's prophecy. Similar to Nahum's in that God would use a wicked nation to punish His people. God used Assyria to punish the northern tribes. Now He is going to use Babylon to punish the southern kingdom of Judah. And thus we see God's providential hand in using wicked men. God still works in His providence today to uplift and to tear down. But ultimately, God will be glorified. And after God dealt with His people in the northern kingdom through Assyria, He turned around and destroyed the Assyrians. In like manner, He is going to destroy Babylon after He is through using them as they are dealing the punishing blow to His people of Judah. Habakkuk's prophecy was near the end of the 7th century B.C., around 606 to 604. Habakkuk's prophecy was in a sad time. During the reigns of Jehoahaz and his brother Eliakim, or whose name was changed to Jehoiakim by the Babylonian ruler, according to 2 Kings chapter 23, verses 31 to 37, Sadly, they were unlike their father, King Josiah, who did that which was right in the eyes of the Lord. 2 Kings 22 and verse 2. They were not like him. And this reminds us, of course, of principles today. That often we will have a godly set of parents, and yet the child will not follow in their footsteps. 
This was the case with King Josiah. He was a godly man. But yet his two sons were very wicked. And then, of course, we remember in the book of Jeremiah the infamous story of Jehoiakim's penknife. How that he cut the scroll of the Scripture and threw it into the fire. This reminds us of something that happened or was reported the week before Memorial Day recently. How that Bibles were burned over in Afghanistan. A religious group sent these Bibles over to our military to disperse among the Afghan people. But there were one or two or a few, I don't know how many military leaders that decided those Bibles should be burned. And of course, this is on many websites on the internet that you can read about this news. And I'm sure there are many people in the military who would be dead against such a thing. Even in the leadership. So we're not saying people in the military are against the Bible, per se. But I would not want to be in the shoes of that person or persons who destroyed those Bibles or who gave the order for them to be destroyed. We see how that God dealt with Jehoiakim. How is God going to deal with people today who seek to destroy His Word or to defy the holy name of God? We see that Habakkuk's prophecy was during a time when God's people began to be carried away to Babylon. And when we think about God's hand upon Judah and how wicked they had become, we cannot help but think about our nation today, the United States of America. And we love our nation. And we love our people here. And not all have bowed the knee to the image of Baal, so to speak. But nonetheless, friends, we see many ungodly things going on in our society, and some of them with the approval of the governmental authorities. The Bible says that righteousness exalts the nation, but sin is a reproach to any people, Proverbs 14 and verse 34. And the wicked shall be turned into hell, and all the nations that forget God, Psalm 9 and verse 17. In the introduction to Habakkuk, those who wrote the comments in the margin of the New Analytical Bible, the Dixon Bible, said this, The mission of the prophet, that is Habakkuk, is to announce the downfall of Babylon after Judah has been refined in the Chaldean crucible, that is, the crucible of the Babylonians. I believe that's a very insightful statement. That God does use that crucible to refine His people and to preserve a remnant that is a righteous remnant, a faithful people. And today when we look at our brotherhood and we see the many things that are going on, we cannot help but be shocked to concern when we see brethren who once stood for the truth and congregations who were once faithful now bearing off in the compromise and leaving the truth. But there is a faithful few today there's a group who are bent on staying for the truth and doing what is right. But Isaiah said, Behold, I have refined thee, but not with silver, that is, as silver. I have chosen thee in the furnace of affliction. God lets us go through that furnace that we may become stronger. James said, Knowing this at the trying of your faith, work with patience. James 1 and verse 3. In Hebrews 12 and verse 6, For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. Over in the book of 1 Peter, in the first chapter, in verse number 7, that the trial of your faith, being much more precious than a gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory of the appearing of Jesus Christ. But all of us are going to be purged if we stay close to God. God is going to allow us to be tried that we may come forth as pure gold. In Proverbs 25 and verse 4, Take away the dross from the silver, and there shall come forth a vessel for the finer. In the meantime, though, there is going to be great suffering among God's people in Judah. And a great faith is going to be required. And hence the theme, the just shall live by faith. We see that the prophet has ever in mind the day of trouble that is coming. And in Habakkuk chapter 3 and verse number 16, 
But the prophet begins the book asking the question of why. In the first chapter, beginning at verse 1, the burden which Habakkuk the prophet did see, O Lord, how long shall I cry, and thou wilt not hear? Even cry out unto thee of violence, and thou wilt not save. Why dost thou show me iniquity, and cause me to behold grievance? For spoiling and violence are before me, and there are that raise up strife and contention. Therefore the law is slack, and judgment doth never go forth. For the wicked doth compass about the righteous, therefore wrong judgment proceedeth. We might think, well, he's talking about Babylon there, but no, he's talking about the wickedness in his people Judah. And so God, here was a desire on the part of the prophet for God to deal with Judah, to purify and to purge them. Habakkuk was a man of great concern over the souls of men and the state of God's people here. And it's obvious. A model for Christians and congregations, preachers and elders today. He was a great man of concern. We see his love, concern, and his grief and dismay and pity for the oppressed. He was disturbed over sin. And he cried out unto God. How many times today do we cry out unto God? That's a challenge for us here tonight. Do we cry out unto God as elders and preachers and members of the church? For the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous, and His ears are open unto their prayers, but the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. 1 Peter 3 and verse 12. You know, the people of Babylon were a wicked people. They were guilty of blood, according to Habakkuk 2, verses 8, 12, and 17. Innocent blood. And that reminds us again of something in our country today that is legalized, and that is legalized murder and abortion. The putting to death of a little unborn child. In Proverbs 6, 16-19, the wise man said that one of the things that God hates is the hands that shed innocent blood. What could be more innocent than a little unborn child? And sad at the very top of our government today, we have individuals who have pushed and promoted abortion. What a sad day it is in our land. And we need to be like Habakkuk. We need to be concerned. Jeremiah said, Is it nothing to you, all ye that pass by? Lamentations 1 and verse 12. If we're not careful even in the Lord's church, we can become lukewarm and apathetic about these things. We can become unconcerned about lost souls who are headed for eternal destruction. We can become unconcerned about a sad state of affairs in the church of our Lord. But no, we need to be like the man of God, Habakkuk. But God answers the prophet, beginning in verse number 5, Behold you among the heathen and regard and wonder marvelously, for I will work a work in your days which ye will not believe, though it be told you. We know this warning culminated around 586 B.C. when God allowed, and again this is God's providence, allowing things to happen. He allowed the Babylonians to come in and destroy Jerusalem and the temple. And this was indeed a marvelous and a terrible work. You know, Paul used that scripture over in the synagogue in Antioch of Pisidia in Acts 13 on the first missionary journey when he and Barnabas went in there. Sometime after this, or after he gave that sermon, we know that the Jews were disturbed and he declared they would turn into the Gentiles. But you know, there was going to be another destruction off in the future. One wonders if this is one reason that Paul used that scripture. Because of those Jews who rejected Jesus Christ and the gospel, we know this is why Jerusalem and the temple were destroyed in A.D. 70. And he gives this warning here in Acts chapter 13, verse 41. He brings up a painful thought to the Jews. How the very rejection of God's word in the long ago resulted in their destruction. Now what about it now? Reject Christ the gospel and again there is going to be destruction. Now as we think about Babylon tonight, 
God allowed some things to happen through this heathen nation of Babylon. Now friends, when we think about the providence of God this evening, how many things we do not even know about that God does providentially? How many times He protects us and shields us and holds us in His hand? And I'm not talking about in the sense of salvation, because when we're saved, we know that we're in the Father's hand. According to Jesus in John 10, I'm talking about the times that God protects us providentially. But yet there are times in history as we look at God's people when they rebelled against the Lord and His law, He removed that protective hand and allowed things to happen to His people. This should strike fear and awe in our hearts upon the contemplation of ever departing from the living God. We know that the Scriptures teaches that the wrath of man shall praise thee. Psalm 76 verse 10. We see the wrath of man praising God through Babylon. And then the rest of that verse says, The remainder of wrath shalt thou restrain. God's providential restraining hand is in there too. God's mighty hand of providence. Now the Chaldeans or the Babylonians were a very wicked people. And thus Habakkuk asked the question in verse number 13, Thou art of pure eyes unto behold evil, and cast not look on iniquity. Wherefore lookest thou upon them that deal treacherously, and, behold, and holdest thy tongue when the wicked devoureth the man that is more righteous than he? How can the pure and high and holy Jehovah God have anything to do with the nation of Babylon? How can He do this? This is the question that is perplexing the great prophet Habakkuk. But God does work through wicked men. He does use wicked men to bring about His purpose. Many people are going to be destroyed in the Babylonian overthrow. But the prophet says, We shall not die. In verse number 12, Art thou not from everlasting, O Lord my God, mine Holy One? We shall not die, O Lord. Thou hast ordained them for judgment. And O mighty God, Thou hast established them for correction. This doesn't mean that godly people will never die an untimely death or at an early age. But it means that we are not given to perishing. We may be chastened, corrected, and carried away, but ultimately we are not going to perish. And of course we here are the righteous, the righteous remnant. He's talking about we shall not die. But there were many people already perishing spiritually in the land of Judah. And of course, this is the most serious perishing of all, to lose one's soul. And this is what Habakkuk has foremost in mind when he speaks of the just shall live by faith. The Lord is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. 2 Peter 3, 9. In fact, God gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believed in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. John 3 and verse 16. It's not the Lord's will that any precious soul perishes before God and is lost. But yet many are. Even this night, there are many who are rejecting the gospel of Jesus Christ. We often have questions about God. We have questions about why He may do the things that He does. But we are never to question the integrity of God or His righteousness. We may be like Job or Habakkuk and wonder why, but yet we know and we trust that God is right in all things that He's going to do that which is right. Job said, Though He slay me, yet will I trust Him. Job 13, verse 15. And Habakkuk near the end of his book says that he is going to trust Jehovah God no matter what. Verses 17 and 18. Although the fig tree shall not blossom, neither shall fruit be in the vines. The labor of the olive shall fail, and the field shall yield no meat. The flock shall be cut off from the fold, and there shall be no herd in the stalls. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. There's something here that reminds us of Philippians, the fourth chapter. Paul said in that chapter, I have learned in whatsoever state I am, therewith to be content. Is not the prophet here teaching 
godliness with contentment is great gain, as Paul did in 1 Timothy 6 and verse 6. But no matter come what may, I am going to rejoice in the Lord, as Paul from a prison wrote to the Philippians, Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say, rejoice. Philippians 4 and verse 4. He begins the next verse, The Lord God is my strength. Did not Paul say, I can do all things through Christ who strengtheneth me? Philippians 4 and verse number 13. But now the just shall live by faith. We will live by faith, and faithfulness and faith go hand in hand. We're not talking about a faith apart from faithfulness. The idea here, the principle underlying is, yes, faith, but it involves faithfulness. We must be faithful if we're going to be just and live accordingly by this, if we're not going to perish, but to be saved. This speaks of a close relationship with God. Like Enoch had, Genesis 5.24. Enoch walked with God. And we learn in Hebrews 11.5 that by faith he pleased God. The man who walks by faith is like Abraham, who was called the friend of God. But Abraham was obedient to God. Even to the point that when God told him to take his son, his only son, up upon a mountain and slay him in sacrifice, in Genesis 22, he was willing to do it. And ready to do it until God prevented him from doing so. Here we have the thought of trust and obey. There's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. Jesus said in John 15 and verse 14, You are my friends if you do, Whatsoever I command you. Again, the man of pride is puffed up. He is not trusting the Lord. He is trusting in himself. But the godly man walks by faith. He trusts the Lord and obeys his will. We know here in the back of chapter 2, verses 15 and 16, regarding the Babylonians, woe unto him that giveth his neighbor drink that puttest thy bottle to him, and makest him drunken also, that thou mayest look on their nakedness. Thou art filled with shame for glory. Drink thou also, and let thy, and let thy foreskin be uncovered. The cup of the Lord's right hand shall be turned unto thee, and shameful spewing shall be on thy glory. What is God going to do on the glory of Babylon? He is going to shamefully cause spewing to be upon it. Shameful spewing, the Bible says. The Babylonians and their great power and might and their cruelty gave glory to their gods, their idols. Verse 11, Then shall his mind change, and he shall pass over and offend, imputing this his power unto his God. Do you think Jehovah God is going to allow that to stand? Is the true and living God going to allow the Babylonians to prevail and give glory to their false gods, their idols? Now think about this today. Is God going to allow Islam to prevail and ultimately for Allah to be glorified? You think about that question. Is He going to allow that? Not the God of heaven. Oh, they may have their little day to a certain extent. But ultimately, God is going to deal with all the wicked who are against Him and His people and the truth. He is going to deal with them as He has dealt with Babylon, Assyria, and other nations. Whether it be a religious nation or a geographical nation, God is going to deal with them. On that we can rest assured. There is a sense in which faith helps man to live in this life. Peter talks about those who would love life and see good days in 1 Peter 3, 10 to 12. We know that in the days of the destruction of Jerusalem, who were those who escaped there in AD 70 when the Roman general Titus approached the city? The Lord had given them certain signs there in Luke 21, for example, of what to do. They were to flee. And you know, all of those who walked by faith and obeyed what Jesus said, 
got out of that city and did not perish without one exception. Brother Guyan Woods points out that the general drew back for a time. After approaching the city of Jerusalem to besiege it, then he withdrew for a period of time just long enough to let the Christians get out. Now whose hand was in that? No doubt God must have had something to do with that to allow His people to escape. Yes, walking by faith will help us to live and survive and be preserved. That's true. But yet the ultimate principle here is not physical or earthly survival. So let's go over to the book of Hebrews at this time. In Hebrews, the 10th chapter. <clears throat> And beginning in verse number 37. For yet a little while, and he that shall come will come, and will not tarry. Now, of course, this was about seven years before the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70. So this is not the ultimate final day of judgment of the Lord's second coming in that sense. But this is the Lord's coming against Jerusalem and the Jews and relieving His people of that severe persecution that they were undergoing. Now the just shall live by faith, but if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. Herein that statement is made again, the just shall live by faith. But we are not of them who draw back unto perdition, that is, perishing. That's the opposite of living is to perish, is to be lost, to lose one's soul. But we are not of them who draw back, that is, those who turn and cease to have trusting, obedient, abiding faith in the Lord. But we are not of them who draw back unto perdition, but of them that believe to the saving of the soul. Now friends, that is the idea here of living. It is the saving of the soul. That is the ultimate life. To be saved from sin and then ultimately in heaven, eternal life with Jesus Christ. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life with Jesus Christ our Lord. Romans 6 and verse number 23. You know, as we think about this evening, as we come to a conclusion, there are certain lessons and principles we need to consider in a back of Babylon glorified their idols and false gods. The true and living God is to be glorified by the church. For you are bought with a price, Paul said. Therefore glorify God in your body and your spirit, which are God's. 1 Corinthians 6 and verse 20. In Matthew 5 and verse 16, Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Habakkuk represents himself as setting upon his watch and upon a tower waiting for God's answers. In Habakkuk chapter 2 and verse number 1, I will stand upon my watch, and set me upon the tower, and will watch to see what He will say unto me, and what I shall answer when I am reproved. Again, this is not skepticism on the part of the prophet, but he is sincerely and earnestly seeking for an answer from God. He could not understand why God would use Babylon to punish His people. But God answers him in no uncertain terms in verses 2 and 3. He said, The Lord answered me and said, Write the vision and make it plain upon tables that He may run that readeth it. For the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it shall speak and not lie. Though it tarry, wait for it, because it will surely come. It will not tarry. God's truth is going to come. What He has promised is going to come, and we can be assured of that. And He tells the prophet to make it plain. This is what we need today, is plain gospel preaching. We need preachers who make it plain in no uncertain terms, who preach the Word, 2 Timothy 4, verse 2. Like Jeremiah who said that the Word was as a Fire in his bones. He could not stay. He couldn't contain. He couldn't hold it in. Jeremiah 20 and verse number 9. The preacher is a dying man preaching to dying men. 
And time is running out. We need to make it plain. But then God will deal with wicked nations. He is going to deal with the wicked. What is the underlying problem in our country today? Look at Habakkuk 2 and verse number 20. But the Lord is in His holy temple. Let all the earth keep silence before Him. This is in the chapter where He promises that God is going to deal with wicked Babylon. What is the point? The point is, fear God, not man. Jesus said, And fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear Him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. God is to be feared and to be reverenced. In Romans 3.18, Paul speaks of those who have no fear of God before their eyes. This is the underlying problem we have in this country today. No respect, and no reverence, and no fear of God on the part of many people. And yet the preacher said, this is the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep His commandments. For this is the whole duty of man. For God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. In Ecclesiastes 12, 13 and 14. God is going to deal with the wicked. But you know, the faith can stand the test. If we have true faith, the Word of God can stand questioning. We may have doubts and questions about things, but that doesn't mean that we doubt the veracity and the integrity of God and His Word. True faith can stand the test. The truth can stand questioning, and thus we see in Habakkuk. He concludes, the Lord is my strength. He questions there in chapter 2. And in chapter 1, rather, verses 12 and 13. But yet it concludes, The Lord is my strength. I am going to trust Him no matter what. Habakkuk, one who embraces, clings to God no matter what. Now friends, let's keep that with us when we think about Habakkuk. The one whose name means one who embraces. Habakkuk embraced God in the sense that he clung to God. He cleaved unto God. Regardless of all these things that he was going through, he cleaved unto God. James said in James chapter 4 and verse number 8, Draw nigh to God, and He will draw nigh unto you. Yes, beloved, tonight as we conclude, let us be like Habakkuk, who taught and who lived, the just shall live by faith. And the Lord is in His holy temple. And one who drew near unto God, who said, The Lord is my strength. Let us embrace and draw near to and cling to God no matter what in these troublesome times. Thank you.